Hi, I'm Janelle Nanos, business reporter with the Boston Globe, and this is Bold Types, conversations with Boston's business leaders. For this week's episode, I'm sitting down with Neeraj Shah, co-founder and CEO of home furnishings giant Wayfair. I cover retail for the Boston Globe and was eager to sit down with Neeraj for this series. But less than two weeks after we filmed this interview, I became aware that Wayfair employees were planning a walkout over the company's decision to sell beds to a government contractor running camps for migrant children on the U.S.-Mexico border. The Globe broke the story of the Wayfair walkout, was on site the day of the protests, and continues to report on the issue. In the weeks since our taped interview, we asked Wayfair executives to comment directly about their position on camera, but they declined. They provided the following statement to the Globe. Our business is built on our ability to bring diverse groups of smart, talented people together to solve complex problems. We have taken the same approach with this issue and are constructively engaging with our employees. We are encouraged by the dialogue and are excited for the ideas and solutions that we land on together. And now, my interview with Neeraj Shah. We are on Newbury Street outside of Sanzi. Um, why exactly? This isn't necessarily where you're putting your next Wayfair storefront, but this has some resonance and relevance to you. What's the history here? Well, when we started CSN Stores, predecessor to Wayfair in 2002, we started in Steve's house and we quickly outgrew the small room that we had there. Mm-hmm. So in January of 2003, we moved into our first office for this company, which is right here on the second floor, right above, right above Sanzi. Now, why was it important for you to have a Newbury Street address? I know we talked once about how you were um, trying to sell yourselves to furniture companies and they didn't quite understand that you were an online company, that you were a brand, but you didn't have an actual physical presence. Talk to me a little bit about that story. 2002 was a time when the internet was not viewed in great, great stead because of the dot-com crash in 2000. And so when we were trying to get manufacturers to want to sell their goods to us, they were wary of internet companies. So the name CSN Stores helped because it was very generic sounding. Mm-hmm. And so we would be in High Point with the furniture market talking, talking to some folks about carrying their line. Mm-hmm. And we'd be able to get pretty far in the conversation before they figured out that we were an online retailer. Mm-hmm. But it did turn out that then we had an office on Newberry Street, they could visit us and that helped as well. This is your uh, relatively new office uh, down a little bit further into Back Bay. Um, you've got, what, a thousand people here and moved in earlier this year? We've been headquartered above the Copley Mall for years now, and we more or less have maximized the amount of space we have up there. So we have about room for 7,000 people up there. But we've reached a point where we have 7,000 people in Boston, and, so, <laughs> and we're growing quite quickly. We're trying to add 2,000 people over the next year. So. Just, uh, just a few months ago, we were able to get 400,000 square feet here, 500 Boylston Street, 222 Berkeley. So we're gonna be able to have 4,000 people here over the next few years as we move into all of our space. Today, as, as you mentioned, we have 1,000 people here already. Not only are you investing in your own marketing and your own, you know, you have your own internal teams that build all your ads, it's all in-house, but you also have invested a lot in your own supply chain. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about that. I know I've lost track of the number of warehouses you have now, but yeah. how does that factor into your overall growth strategy as well? Owning and, and controlling that supply chain, I'm sure is a big part of your strategy. I want to understand why. Today, we have over 14 million square feet of logistics space, and we continue to expand that aggressively. And it's used for basically a few key things to drive the speed of delivery up significantly. Today, a meaningful portion of what comes out of those buildings is next day delivery, and then the rest is basically two day delivery. And so we have a very fast network, and as we grow, it automatically becomes faster and faster because each incremental location we open gets us even closer to customers. The other thing we do, 30% of our business are these larger, bigger, bulkier items that you really are delivering with two people and into the home or into a location in the backyard. We're, we're now delivering that with our own delivery operations out of 40, approximately 40 terminals that we've set up around the US. So for example, here in Boston, we have a building in Westboro, Massachusetts that we run you know, many trucks every day out of delivering throughout Rhode Island, throughout Eastern Massachusetts. All those orders ourselves where the quality of delivery is higher, so customers are happier and the speed of delivery is much faster, mm-hmm. both at the same time. Your critics often say, Yes, this company is growing. Yes, their stock price is increasing. Profitability is the, is the thing here that a lot of people point to and say, but they're still not profitable. They lost uh, half a billion dollars last year. How do you respond to them when they say, 
yes, Wayfair is seeing growth, and, um, but it's still not profitable, um, and will they ever be profitable? What you need to do is you need to look at our U.S. business or our international business separately and then understand the timeline for each. When we went public in 2014, in the beginning of 2014, we had an EBITDA of approximately negative 7%. And at the time, the, the entire business was basically a U.S. business. Mm -hmm. Then if you look now, which is basically five years later, so it's not very long later, mm -hmm. the U.S. has been profitable in seven of the last 10 quarters. Mm -hmm. and it's been hovering between basically minus one and plus 1%. Mm -hmm. And so for it to cover that seven percentage points in the five years, while we grew so fast, you said, well, how, how does that happen, right? Because the rate of growth has been tremendously quick, mm -hmm. and yet the profitability has incre increased and improved dramatically. Mm -hmm. The truth is the revenue, I think last quarter, grew over 40% year over year. Mm -hmm. The revenue is growing so quickly, and the profitability of the revenue, the, the gross margin, has actually risen, not fallen. And in the meantime, the international business, which we're aggressively investing in Europe and in Canada right now, and it's doing incredibly well, it needs to do the same thing the U.S. did, which is building a brand in the early days is expensive. Mm -hmm. And so until you get to a certain scale where you have a big repeat base of customers, mm -hmm. you can't really amortize those expenses, so you will lose some money. Mm -hmm. But as long as it keeps on the same trajectory, the same exact thing then happens to the international business over a number of years. You've also obviously been looking at store concepts for a while. Um, you know, you've been an online retailer for a very long time now, but um, you experimented with it in a couple of formats. And now, as of later this year, you're going to be opening your first storefront in Natick. Can you tell us more about the store and how will the Natick store be different from a traditional furniture store? Over the years, we've always tried to find new ways to engage with customers. It can be an other way that we can reach you, and a, that in the channel of an in-person interaction. There are things we can do that are hard to do over the phone or over email or you know, through a catalog. So what can we do? Well, we can incrementally get more customers. And then for our existing customers, it can be a reason, a vehicle, where they can buy more from us per year. So what is the shopping experience actually going to be like? I mean, you obviously can't like stock 14 million items. So our feeling is that there's no format in which we can consider what we would put in a store a representative sampling. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is we need it to be a way where you can engage with us, where you can have an understanding of what we do, but also we need to have technology and other ways that you're gonna be able to interact and really explore the whole catalog. Mm -hmm. And so we're building in a very modular way so we can try a lot of different concepts. So we call the series Bold Types. And I always like to ask if there was a moment in your career when you felt like you had to make a bold decision, um, or if you're making that bold decision now, frankly. You know, I, I would say the biggest bold decision that I made in my career, we made at this company, was uh, we had a successful $500 million business, and we decided that really to capture the very big opportunity in home, we needed a brand. And we changed the model of the company. We closed those 250 websites. And the reason it was uh, risky is that you know, building those 250 different websites had led to the successful outcome where we were a $500 million business. Mm -hmm. But what we also had come to the conclusion was that there was a huge opportunity to be the, you know, the leading, the winning platform for home. But we knew that to do that required building a brand. Even though we were putting the existing model we had at risk, it was really the only way to really go after what we saw as the huge opportunity.